Good afternoon to you, one minute to two, or it's probably about 30 seconds to two. And I said I was going live at two o'clock today because I probably will not go live on Thursday. So I thought I'll do an e-Tuesday session today. So let's see who can join in. And when you join in, please say hi in the comments. And then I can greet you and we can get into today's session. I've called it Landmarks and Landmines in the Prophetic. So let's have a look and see who is going to join in and where are we going to go to. Um, two o'clock on a Tuesday afternoon. Um, I, I'm not sure. Barbara Hassan, good to see you. Barbara, you're going to get an email sometime soon for a Zoom link for next week. I won't give you the day. I'll wait till you get your email. Um, Deirdre van der Valt, welcome to you. Bianca Mears, hi to you and thank you for tagging Wendy Lee. Um, this morning, Rory invited me onto his live session and um, we had such an interesting chat. Daniel Dabrowski, we had such an interesting chat about Elijah and Jezebel and what happens, and I had a whole message around the same thing. Rory's got different insight to what I had, but it's along the same lines that Jezebel um, is after God's prophetic voice. Um, that's just a very small nutshell of what we spoke about this morning. So if you, if you weren't there, if you didn't listen to it, you can go onto his profile, Rory Mole, and you will see the discussion we had. And I might bring some of the things in here that I mentioned on his broadcast, um, his broadcast, his TV program, his show, um, his live session. Let's call it his live session. Um, I preached a message in our church on Sunday morning about it's time for the church to get out from under the broom tree because Elijah was running away from Jezebel after his whole journey. I laid it out. His whole journey, I will greet you in a minute, I'm just laying a foundation, his whole journey of, um, you know, from the brook Cherith, the widow at Zarephath, seeing the supernatural move of God in his life, and then one threat from Jezebel sends him running into the wilderness, it says he fled for his life, and he sat under the broom tree in the wilderness, and he said, it's enough, Lord, take my life, I'm no better than my father's. And I looked at what got him to this place after seeing the power of God, the fire of God and, and the rain. He prophesied the rain and, and amazing things. The hand of God came on Elijah and he outran the chariot of the enemy. And I believe in these days, I want to give you one thing. There's an anointing coming upon God's prophets and prophetic people. And all his people are meant to be prophetic to outrun the plans of the enemy, to outrun the, the chariot of the enemy, um, where we are the ones. You know, he outran Ahab to the, to the entrance of Jezreel, the gates, the entrance. And the church, God's people, are the ones who say, lift up your heads, O you gates, that the King of glory may come in. And um, instead of cowering to Jezebel and running in the opposite direction, the gates are the places of influence where we receive communication from the king and decisions are made and decrees are made. And so we're in the season now where we need to walk in this. And that's what, that's what we're looking at today. So Daniel Dubrovsky, so good to see you. I'm glad you say spot on for today. Wendy Lee, hi again. Fantini Wilters, it has been forever. I actually meant to send you a message and I didn't get around to it. So I'm so glad you are here. Annika Miller, good to see you. Megan Hope, good afternoon. Ilana Jakobison, good afternoon. And Barbara, you are looking forward to that email. I'll probably send it this evening. Natasha McCarston, it's been a while. Nice to see you. Um, I said hi to Deirdre van der Waal and Bianca Mears. I said hello. I think Bianca and Deirdre van der Waal were the first people here. Louise Hammer, and good to see you here this afternoon. Okay, let's get into it. Um, okay, so landmarks are milestones, places of where we see God has moved and has established things, and landmines, you know what landmines are. 
<laughs> it's like you go walking in the park and other people's dogs have dropped landmines somewhere and you stand in it and it's a big mess. Okay, it's a good way to, to describe it. So today, the landmarks. I'm, I'm going to bring in a little bit of Elijah, but I first want to give you what I've got here before I go back to Elijah, because you can always hear the Elijah stuff on Rory's profile. Or uh, my, my full message, you can find it on New Life Vineyard on their page, uh, because they did record the whole thing. Um, you'll see me there standing behind a pulpit <laughs> and my head. Um, but they recorded the whole message on Sunday, and this is something that's on my heart, that just as Elijah went through this whole journey, and he saw the hand of God, and he saw God move, and he called down fire, and he prophesied rain, he prophesied drought, and then he prophesied rain, and a whole lot of stuff happened. It's like a line was drawn in the sand at some point where the enemy rose up, where Jezebel in 1 Kings 19 sent a message to um, Elijah saying, just as you have done to the prophets of Baal, her prophets, just as you have done um, to them, this is what I'm going to do to you by this time tomorrow. It was a threat. It was a message sent by a messenger. And it says when Elijah saw that, then he, um, he fled for his life. And he sat under the broom tree and he said, I can't do this anymore. He gave up. He ran in the opposite direction. And so at that time, a line was drawn in the sand and the enemy was saying, I'm going to take you out. And now in the New Testament today, because of what's going on around us, there's a lot of intimidation. There's a lot of opposition. And so God's people need to recognize which side we're on. We are not the people who run into the wilderness and give up. We are not... Um, Ilana, I'm so far from being a pastor. I am not a pastor. So, um, but thank you for that. So, so God said the church was going somewhere. He said his prophetic, um, his people in the Old Testament were going somewhere. It was the promised land. They were on a journey. They were moving somewhere. Lisa Spagnolo, good to see you. Um, so they were on a journey somewhere. And today we can see Prophetic people have been raised up by the prophets. There have been voices to the nations declaring the plans of God. The old is over, but we don't know what the new is yet. God's anointing is not on the old things anymore. You know that sense of doing what's familiar to you, you do it the same way, you, you continue doing what you know to do, but you know that there's got to be something more. And so we wait in faith for the new, but the anointing, that deep presence of God, that soaking rain is not on the old. And so there's this feeling of unsettledness that we're going on a journey, but we're just taking one step at a time, <laughs> faithfully committed to do what God said we need to do. So the answer to me in this season is in Isaiah 40, where I'll read it to you. And the reason is, we're receiving something fresh and something new, but the answer is to let God do it. Let God be God. So in Isaiah 40 verse 28, have you not known? And you all know this, but I've got to read it. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak. And to those who have no might, he increases strength. So maybe today, on this journey to the new, you feel that you have no might. You feel you've heard the threats, the opposition, the intimidation coming from the enemy's camp. And it would be easier to go and sit in the wilderness. Lauren Stain, good to see you. It would be easier to go and sit in the wilderness under the uh, broom tree that's more familiar and moving into something that is not familiar. And so people stay there. And they count the grains of the sand, you know, <laughs> gather, collecting the, the wilderness, the desert sand as a memorial to where they have been. It's time to shake that off and to move on. So, um, so it says, even the youths shall faint and be weary and the young men shall utterly fall. So it's a supernatural thing that God is doing because young men don't faint and get weary. Young men don't utterly fall. 
But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. And so I've had the sense, Barbara, Barbara's here. When I prayed for you on Saturday, I saw this image of you with these huge wings. <laughs> and there are so many people in the body of Christ who have everything God has given them. But because the waiting has been so long, because the journey seems so dry and so hard, because of the intimidation and the opposition, it's like, let's just fold in these wings and let's wait. And so I want to stir you today and awaken you today that there are new wings that are growing and they're going to be stronger than the other one. You know, that's what happens with an eagle. It gets to a certain age or it does things up until a certain point and those wings have to be plucked out the eagle itself plucks those wings out and it goes to higher places and it waits for the regrowth of those new wings so i really believe that the church especially the prophetic is in a season of refreshing restoration coming back more powerful than it has ever been and so today i'm just talking to you a little bit about the landmarks of the prophetic on the way to get to the promised land the israelites were aware that there were giants in the promised land there were giants there but the giants were in intimidation because god said i'm going to be with you we're going to do this thing i'm being with you so it's what you see now as a prophetic person about the future of your church your business your life your family the nation whatever it is it's what you see now that determines your faith do you see yourself standing in front of a giant and being a giant slayer? <laughs> or do you see yourself as a grasshopper? Because it's how, what you see. When Elijah heard the message from Jezebel, he, it says when he saw it, he turned and ran for his life into the wilderness. He didn't, it doesn't say when he heard the message. When he read the message, he received the message. It says when he saw it. Jezebel was not even there. It was a message. And when he heard that, he turned and he ran. So in this season, there's a lot of movie making going on in the realm of the spirit from the enemy's camp. Trying to show you things that you don't, aren't meant to be seeing. Not that they're secret, but are we seeing that God said, I'm with you. My word is the word that's going to happen. I need you to stand in authority. I need you to, uh, you know, see that you're anointed, that you're called for these days. And whatever I've given you to do, you can do with my help. So it's not a case of, you know, the intimidation is there and we fold because we see the scenarios played out in our heads. So it's what you see now. It's what you hear now from God that will determine your faith. And it's so important because... Our strengths, just as much as the, the one thing is to wait, as those wings, those eagles, I don't talk about eagles, wings and feathers and whatever else, as, as is a, a renewal coming to God's prophets and prophetic people, because God is taking, taking us further, so we need to see more, we need to hear more, we need to declare more. But it's as you're waiting and you don't understand what's happening in your life that God is preparing you, that you feel that you are burnt out, that you are too tired to carry on. Have you begun to question? Here's some things that you can think about. Have you grown weary or tired of waiting? And we all get there. It's like, I've waited so long. And it's when you are at that point where I, I can't wait anymore. That the breakthrough is just right there. <laughs> I want to say, if he says wait, wait. Have you begun to question whether God can still do what he said he was going to say? You know, do you feel like this grasshopper and you've got these fantastic promises in front of you, but you're questioning, can God really do what he said? That's the movie that the spirit of Jezebel is the message. The spirit of Jezebel is sending to you, hoping that you're going to see something and turn and run into the wilderness. That is the message that's coming today. The, the opposition has grown has increased. The opposition has increased because of what God is about to do. And if we recognize this, we're going to be aware of it. And we're not going to be those people who run into the wilderness and sit there feeling sorry for ourselves. 
and there's a whole lot of stuff that we might get into. I think it's important that I do get into it. Um, but the level of the prophetic has been raised. Not sure if you're aware of this, but it, yeah, I had, I had such, a, I'd say it was a, a download from God this morning that I'm not going to tell you about because it's between myself and God. It's, it's, it was so amazing. It was like a huge key that unlocked. It gave me access into something that God wants to release to me to do what he's given me to do. And you know the one way that you know that you are doing what God has said you should do is when you can't question and say, when you, when you question and you say, have I taken on too much? Should I be doing this? Should I be here? Should I say this? Am I doing the right thing? When you begin to question those things and you realize there's no way I can do this without God, then you're doing the right thing. <laughs> There was not one person in the Bible who felt ready and like, let's go for this God. You know, they all questioned, why God, why are you choosing me? And then when you do that, you, you begin to take on what you need that God has prepared for you and prepared you for. Cynthia Boyson, good to see you. And so I was at that place. I've been at that place for a while, but still doing everything, not holding back still doing it but needing this key and God dropped it this morning and I thought this is amazing this only God can do and so it's, it's like it's added fuel to the faith and the fire that I already have because I've seen what he wants to do and I said yes God I'm available you know when you say yes to God you aren't ready you think you know it all until you actually start doing it and you think I don't know I need God here and, um, and when we get to that place and he just gives us this key, it's like he stuck a key right into my spirit man and turned it. And, I, and like, oh, I um, one day I will be able to tell you, but not today. Because I feel like it's a secret between myself and God. I did tell Rory. He knows everything. <laughs> um, okay, so, so in the season, as the level of the prophetic has been raised, um, you need to know God. You need to know who God is. You need to know, it's so important, the character, because if you don't know God, you will prophesy out of your own understanding. You will prophesy out of what you already know, what you've understood before, what you've seen and do before. And the level of the prophetic has been raised because we need to be prophesying words that deal with the enemy, the lies of the enemy. And, um, and that voice is so loud. So in, in the Old Testament, there was a tribe, I've spoken about them, called the sons of Issachar, the tribe of Issachar. And these guys were the guys who knew the signs of, they knew the seasons, they could discern the seasons and the signs of the times, and they knew what Israel ought to do. This is where God's prophetic prophets need to be, where they've, even though they're not sure what the new is yet, they are in this place where we on the edge saying, God, show me what the season is. What do we need to do? Because it's important. I said this today on Rory's, um, when we were, I was discussing with Rory, is that there was a, there, you know, there's a scripture in Isaiah. He gives us the, the beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise instead of the spirit of heaviness. And we've had conferences around that. People have had conferences, the oil of joy. Give your beauty, your ashes and you'll receive beauty. And we've all had enjoyed it and felt good. But that is powerful. That's where we are now. <laughs> because we have to, and we're going to get there in a minute. We have to hand over the old. We have to hand over the, the, the things we, we can't take into the new in order to receive those powerful things that are going to replace those things of the old. So the conferences were all nice, but those are not just conference cliches or scriptures. Those are powerful things that we need to be activating in the season. He wants to give us the oil of joy instead of depression and discouragement because of the intimidation. The power in the oil of joy. You know, a life that is, is 
founded, rooted, grounded, found, founded, <laughs> the foundation is intimacy with God, who, who, people who know the character of God, there will be joy in their life. There will be peace in their life. It will be easier for them to love, but it's because they know God. <laughs> that is a huge key, when we know God. So the, um, another, another name that keeps coming to me, and you've heard me say this, is Mordecai. In the book of Esther, Mordecai was an equipper, a, one who prepared Esther. He was a mobilizer. He awakened her to her purpose, Mordecai. And his name means change. And so I believe, you know, when I, I looked at Mordecai again this morning, and if you look at the end of the book of Esther, it says somewhere, um, the fear of Mordecai came upon them all. Not the fear of Esther, the fear of Mordecai. This guy was the one who mobilized Esther to go and approach the king. And then she said, if I die, I die. I'm going to do it. <laughs> but, but Mordecai, as I believe, are rising up today. And they're the ones who are equipping, mentoring, discipling, prophesying, teaching other people how to prophesy. The, the Mordecais are the ones who are going to go into the desert after the Elijahs and shake him up from under that broom tree. <laughs> And the angel will be standing on the side doing, baking a cake and, you know, getting the water ready. Um, and, um, but the Mordecai is unnecessary. And I believe in the enemy's camp, there's a rumbling and there's a fear because God is raising up some Mordecai. You might be one. Somebody who's called to equip, to disciple, to mentor, to awaken the body in whatever fashion or form God has called you. To awaken the body to recognize its intimidation that's trying to keep God's people sitting in the wilderness saying, it's enough. I can't do this anymore. And so we're in a season of acceleration. I believe it, that God is accelerating things. He is moving things quicker. He's putting things in place quicker. The suddenlies are here. But just as this is happening, the opposition is rising to try and stop that. So the landmines in the prophetic, I'm going to give you a couple of landmines, <laughs> things we don't want to step on. The landmines are things that can, if we do pick them up and walk in them or operate in them, they can be explosive and dangerous to yourself and to people around you. So we're going to look after the land, look up for the landmines in these things, the landmines. And I want to tell you the first one is the enemy knows your weak points. And so... You can't take anything into the new season that hasn't been given to you by God. And sometimes your weak point is something that you're holding on to that was good for a time, but it's not good for now. And so um, it, there's a choice to be trouble or to be a troubler. Okay, And I, I'm going to explain it this way. The old ways, the, the familiar ways, the familiar things, the security that, in what we have, what we know, they'll make us try and take those things into the new season we're going into, into the promised land, into this place of acceleration where the prophetic bar has been raised. So the security we have in, in the things we have, the, the people we know, we're not going to lose people, I'm not saying that, but the people who've walked with us for a long time and maybe they need to move somewhere else. I don't know. But if we want to hold on to everyone and hold on to everything and when God says, leave it all behind, we end up becoming a trouble, not a blessing. And we're going to look at something very quickly in it's, um, I, I'm not going to ask you to turn there, but it's in the book of Joshua. Um, when God had said to them, maybe I need to read it. It's in Joshua. If you've got a Bible, it's Joshua, I think it's Joshua chapter 5 or Joshua chapter 7. I'll get it. Joshua chapter 7, uh, 6. Um, Joshua is leading the people into the promised land, which is Canaan. But there's a valley on the way into Canaan known as the Valley of Achor, A-C-H-O-R. And it is mentioned in... The book of Hosea. I'll read you the scripture in the book of Hosea first, the valley of Achor, Hosea 2, 15. Therefore, behold, I will allure her. This is after God says they turned their back on me and this and that. 
And then God says, I will bring her into the wilderness and speak comfort to her. I will give her her vineyards from there and the valley of Achor as a door of hope. You know, God always turns things around, redeems them and makes them better than they were before. She shall sing there as in the days of her youth, as in the day when she came up from the land of Egypt. Now the valley of Achor mentioned here was the valley on the way into Canaan that Joshua and his people had to pass through. But something happened here in the days of Joshua. Jericho was on the boundary between Achor and Canaan. And you know the story of Jericho. They go in there, they have this great battle, the walls fall down and they take the city of Jericho. But then, after Jericho was taken, the Israelites were all ready to take the next place that was called Ai, and it's spelled Ai. Maybe South Africa, we can say I, okay? God told Joshua, don't take anything from Jericho, the battle of Jericho. This is what he says in Joshua chapter 6 verse 18. And you, by all means, abstain from the accursed things, lest you become accursed when you take of the accursed things and make the camp of Israel a curse and trouble it. Okay. So here's the story. And I'm laying, laying a little bit of a foundation here to bring you an understanding of the importance of the season we are in. So God said, don't take anything. But there was a guy here by the name of Achan, A-C-H-A-N, who took what he wanted. He disobeyed the instruction. He took what he wanted. He took gold things. Um, he took, I'm just trying to find this, the verse where it is. Um, it's in Joshua chapter 7, because here they go and they want to go and take the next city. Ai. But Joshua had already disobeyed the instruction and he took things. He took a Babylonian robe and he took some gold vessels and things and he hid it in his tent. And didn't tell anyone about it. Joshua didn't know about it. God knew about it. And he took the stuff and they went, moved on and they were about to go and take out the next city. The, the rest of the Israelites were all ready to do it because they had seen God conquer Jericho for them. In the next battle of Ai, they were totally defeated. They thought they could do exactly what they did before. They didn't march around the city with jars and then shouts and the walls came down. They obviously did what God said do. But notice it says in Joshua chapter 7, the very first scripture, it says, But the children of Israel committed a trespass regarding the accursed things. For Achan, the son, blah, 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 he took the accursed things. One man disobeyed the things of God. The name of Achan means troubler and the valley of Achor means trouble. Now I'm going to give you some good news in a minute. Achan and his family after this because Joshua went when they were defeated Joshua tore his clothes he fell on the earth on his face before the ark of the Lord until evening and he and the elders of Israel they put dust on their heads and Joshua even said, Alas, Lord God, why have you brought this people over the Jordan at all? He sounded like the Israelites coming out of Egypt. Why have you brought us here? You want us to die here in the wilderness. And he says, Why, did, why have you brought us here? To deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us? Oh, that we had been content and dwelt on the other side of the Jordan. Now this is Joshua speaking to God. <laughs> I don't know if you felt that maybe it would be better for you to stay on the other side of the Jordan and you can just admire the promised land. You can take photographs and you can get postcards from people who've gone. But this is a, this is a serious situation. So God says to him, why, get up. Why do you lie on your face? Israel has sinned. They've taken some of the accursed things and they've both stolen and deceived. They've also put it among their own stuff. Now, 
when I read this, you know, Achan and his family were taken outside of the camp. They were stoned and then a heap of stones was placed upon them and then fire, they burnt it with fire. And it still remains today and it's called the Valley of Achor, the Valley of Trouble. But now I want to go back to Hosea chapter 2 where God said, the valley, I will give her the Valley of Achor as a door of hope. I believe God is turning things around now we're going to look at some of the things so uh, i looked at some of the things firstly but first remember aiken means troubler troubler yeah someone who troubles who causes trouble who has become a stress extra baggage a hindrance elijah on the other hand had a reputation as well as being a troubler look at this 1 Kings 18, and I want to give you a chance to think about, are you a troubler of the enemy's camp, or are you a troubler at the moment? I'll, I'll explain it to you. 1 Kings 18, verse 16. So Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him, and Ahab went to meet Elijah. Then it happened when Ahab, the evil king, saw Elijah, that Ahab said to him, is that you, O troubler of Israel? And he answered, Elijah said this, I have not troubled Israel, but you and your father's house have, in that you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord and have followed the bonds. So God, I believe in this season, is giving us a chance. You know, a lot of people are talking about the shaking in the house of God, the purification, the, the chance to lay things down, the, you know, separating ourselves to God. And I believe this is part of it. Where God is giving us a chance to say, are we like Achan? We may not have stolen things. We may not have gone into a church and stolen robes and gold things. But the things that he brought along ended up becoming trouble to the people of Israel. So much so that they were defeated in the next battle, which was not wanted or needed. But when we are standing in a place of great opposition and about to see great glory, we have to make sure that we are not bringing any of those things that God said. Leave them behind. Make sure you leave all those things behind. The way of thinking, the, the expectations you had in the past, the disappointments, the offense, all of those things have to stay behind because we're moving on to greater ground to see greater glory in the midst of great opposition God wants to do great things, but if we still bring those things, those Babylonian robes and the gold and silver vessels that we were all familiar with, they're going to become hindrances. Instead, I'll give you a couple of thoughts, like partaking of the enemy's goods, because that's what um, Achan did. He partook of the enemy's goods. So, listening to Jezebel, example, listening to Jezebel is the same as partaking of the enemy's goods. If we entertain the lies of Jezebel, just as you have done today, this day, be sure that by this time tomorrow, I'm going to do the same to you. <laughs> that every time you do something for God, that darkness is going to come upon your family, or something is going to happen to you, or you're going to be stripped or robbed, or whatever it is. Those are the intimidating lies of Jezebel. Whenever you start a business or you do this business deal and you start to see finance come in, comes in, come in, Jezebel's going to say, no, I'm going to take that all away from you. You may, you may as well stop giving. You may as well just save it all for a rainy day. These are all the liars of Jezebel getting God's people to stop in their tracks and sit down and say, I've had enough. You know, the power of a message from the enemy's camp, if we allow it, can make us turn and run in the opposite direction, exactly what Elijah did. And so the other thing is offense. If we're offended and we want to bring that, it's like that Babylonian robe. <laughs> we want to clothe ourselves with offense because we'll be like Elijah saying, I'm, I've been zealous for the Lord. You know, I'm the one who's prayed. I'm the one who prophesied and I alone am left. You know, we'll be saying that. And what he was actually saying to God was, I'm a little bit offended <laughs> that one woman can threaten me to take me out. Where were you when that happened? Okay, you know what I'm talking about. So offense with God, and here's the danger for prophecy and prophetic people. 
if people become offended with God, if they be get, become resentful with, towards God because they think he hasn't answered their prayers or he's not using them or he's taking too long, what happens is that they start speaking the language of offense and they start prophesying offense out of offense towards the church. Dangerous, dangerous place to be. So don't bring any offense. Deal with the disappointment. Deal with the feeling that everything is delayed, that God has forgotten about you. Leave it behind like a Babylonian garment. <laughs> Put on the garment of praise. Don't bring offense with you. The other thing is we need to realize that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. If we start to react in the flesh, we're fighting a carnal war, and we cannot win that way. We're just going to get taken out. It's a spiritual war that is raging against you. It's a spiritual war that is raging in the spiritual, in the spiritual realm against your voice. To say what God said. Remember the Issachar prophets? They discerned the times and the seasons and they knew what Israel ought to do. In the book of Esther, in the first chapter, when Queen Vashti did not appear before the king when he called her, um, he called the wise men. And it says the wise men who knew what to do. I think it was that. Or who understood the times. One of those. Um, and this was a heathen uh, society, a pagan culture. He had his wise men around him. Now, you and I today are the wise men in the hand of God and woman, obviously, in the hand of God, who should be able to discern the times and know what to do in our own lives. So they're fiery darts of the wicked one that are coming all the time. Offense, resentment, uh, rejection, insecurity, intimidation. And we've got to have the full armor of God on knowing that we are covered because it's time to stand. It's time to arise and eat. One of the things that God, um, that God did with Elijah was he, Elijah sitting under the broom tree. And if this is you, I want you to listen now, take this seriously. He was sitting under the broom tree. And after this, I'm going to give you how do we trouble the enemy's camp? Because remember, Achan was trouble. And Elijah was the troubler of the enemy. We are troublers of the enemy. Okay, As prophetic people, we are meant to be troublers of the enemy's camp. It's time to not, it's not time to give in to intimidation and to back off. Um, you've got to pick up your mantle in the season. So um, Elijah's lying there under the broom tree. He actually fell asleep. Huh. Do not fall asleep. You call to discern the times and the seasons and to know what to do. And so um, he fell asleep. What does God do? Sent him an angel with a nice comfy pillow and duvet to make him more comfortable to let him sleep a little bit longer. No, he didn't. He woke him up. And when Elijah woke up, he saw here was this angel sent from the kitchens of heaven hand-picked by God, one of the great chefs in heaven, standing there baking a cake on coals, baking bread on coals and water. And he said, arise and eat. So Elijah, who had run a whole day into the wilderness, was hungry and thirsty. So he ate and he drank and he went back to sleep again. There is a bite-sized video about this very thing going up tomorrow morning, maybe in more of a nutshell. I'm spreading it out today. And so... Um, he turned around, he went back to sleep, and the angel woke him up and said, Arise and eat, for the journey is too great for you. And so he ate it. I, when I see that, arise and eat, it's like we've got to be eating and feeding ourselves on what has God said. Because we know the times and the seasons, and we know what to do. We recognize this is intimidation from the enemy. And God sends angelic ministry. God sends a word, arise and eat, because he couldn't do it on his own. He didn't have strength. He wanted to lie there and sleep until God took him away. Um, and so, so God is, I believe God is releasing words to, to, to his people to deal with the fiery darts of the wicked one, to deal with the, the pictures we see in our mind's eye. <laughs> about what the enemy is going to do because God is bigger than that 
So these are a couple of things that will keep you sitting under the broom tree in the wilderness if you don't recognize them. And today I said, I want to stir you and awaken you that this could be happening in your life. And if it is, I want to say to you, the answer is arise and eat. And the eating is meditating on the word of God. What has God said to you? So the first thing is we will stay under the broom tree in the wilderness if we have no foundation of the word in our lives. We don't have other people around us. We're isolated. We don't understand doctrine. We don't understand the character of God. We don't know who we are. It'll be easy to run into the wilderness and stay there. That's why one of the main things I want to do with the women's equipping groups is to get them grounded in who they are, how powerful they are as women of God who've heard something from God, this great God we serve who chooses to use people like you and I. So we have to do that. We've got to get a foundation. The other thing is we forgot we, we forget who God is. Now remember Elijah saw the hand of God. He experienced the power of God. He saw the fire and the rain. He heard the voice of God. He saw the provision of God at the brook Cherith. He saw God multiply flour and oil in the widow of Zarephath's house. And he still raised the widow's son from the dead. And one threat sends him into the wilderness saying, I want to die. So when we forget who God is, what is God saying? Because at some point in a battle, it's easy to forget all your testimonies because you're in the crisis. And God's saying, come up here like that eagle. Come up here. Be where I am. Because from my point of view, you're going to discern what's going on. But instead, if we don't know who God is, we're going to roll over and go back to sleep until we feel better. So he's saying, come up here. That's where we find him and we discern and we see things from his perspective. The other thing is, the, the one thing, that, another thing that will keep you there is distraction. Distraction. So busy dealing with the intimidation and the opinions of other people and the questions and the wrestling with when is this going to happen? Why? These are all darts coming at you. And if we don't realize we become distracted and also busyness about doing things that are good could be distractions that rob us of Hearing God say, come up here. Those are all distractions we have to be aware of. Distractions. Then we forget what God has already done because we're so focused on what he hasn't done yet. Big one. What gets us moving again? We find that God's grace meets us at our weakest point. The devil knows your weak points, but so does God. And God comes with his grace, his empowering divine enablement at your weakest point when you say God I need you so how do another way that we get up from that wilderness is to remember the mission to remember the call that God put in your life to remember that there's a purpose for everything you do everything he says to you there's a purpose you have a mandate you have a mission and um, when I was talking to Rory this is important when Rory and I were talking on his page um, he was talking about Elijah's encounter with God at the cave. After all of this, he gets up and he goes on a 40-day journey through the wilderness until he reaches the mountain, the Mount of Horeb, and he goes into the cave. And, um, and when, you know, there's the earthquake, the wind and the fire thing, and then God speaks to him in the still small voice. And what does Elijah do? He hides his face in his mantle. And you know the mantle... Is symbolic of the assignment the mission that you have in the season it's a mantle his was a prophetic mantle prophet to the nation and he he wrapped his face in that it's like his identity he had to show God that this is who I am his identity had become all about what he did for God and God sp spoke in a still small voice and Rory said this I'll, I'll take his words and he said Elijah couldn't handle the voice of a father coming to him because up until that point in time, it was master and servant. Go and appear before Ahab and say this. Go and do this. Whatever he did was master, servant. I'm a servant of the Lord, Elijah. And, um, and now it was intimacy. Now it was a still, small voice. 
And so, so in these days where there's intimidation and distraction is one of the things that we need to be aware of. Don't let what you do become your identity. It's who you are in Him. It's an intimate relationship with Him. That is your identity and everything you do is out of that. Because in a time of shaking and you're not sure what's going on, it can't be all about, but God, look what I've done for you. That's what Elijah did. <laughs> I've been so zealous for the Lord of hosts. Okay, so you know the story. So now, how do we become troublers of the enemy's camp? Because remember, God says the valley of trouble is going to become a doorway of hope. So the words of hope that we release actually become trouble in the enemy's camp. Because as God's people hear words of hope, Coming from heaven, out of revelation, words of hope. I have not left you nor forsaken you. I have not forgotten you. My plans will still come to pass. I have a, uh, thoughts of peace and not of calamity. All of those things, people declaring, they, they send fiery darts back straight into the enemy's camp to deal with the lies and the intimidation. So words that shift have to be coming out of our mouths, like the voice of a roaring lion. When the enemy is using God's people to do the work of the accuser of the brethren, operating through God's people by releasing words of accusation and judgment against the church. So instead, those words have to become words of hope because then they become troubling to the enemy. Whenever we accuse God's people of things, whether we're right or wrong, when we do it, instead of praying and interceding about those things, in private, and we share them on a public platform, we're doing the work of the accuser. And then our words become troubling in the house of God. <laughs> exactly what Achan did. He brought things with him from the enemy's camp and thought he could get away with it. When we do the work of the accuser, we're taking things that belong in the enemy's camp and operating in the church with those things. That's why God says he doesn't like gossip and there's a whole list of things God doesn't like. <laughs> He wants unity, love, all of those things, because those are our weapons. Those are weapons in the kingdom. So the other thing is, Jesus said, you are the salt and the light. Matthew chapter 5. He didn't say you are going to be the salt one day. When you've got your Bible school degree, you will be the salt and the light. Jesus said, you are. So we are salt and light. And the enemy is opposing that today. Put the news on, you'll see. The enemy's accusing church not not with those words but just every way of the kingdom the righteousness of god the government of god is being opposed um, by bringing all kinds of other ways of thinking and we are the salt and the light so when we live with that being the salt and the light we don't behave the way the world does we then we're going to begin to speak words of hope then the troubling valley becomes a doorway of hope for God's people and for other people who need to come in. So um, a prophet's message. I'm going to read you two scriptures and then we're going to be done here. A prophet's message has to be this. You can do better. <laughs> and it's not a, a condescending or judgmental or rude. It's It's... A word that shifts when somebody says to you, you can do better. It's like you begin to see yourself. Why am I sitting here under the broom tree? It was just an intimidation. <laughs> Why am I feeling sorry for myself? Why am I saying I can't do this anymore? And then you begin to recognize, no, God says I can do better because he's got more for me. <laughs> God, with God, in God, I can do everything. Nothing is impossible. All things are possible with God. And so when we see that we can do better, we actually act like the salt and the light. <laughs> we actually become the people who the devil does not want to be around. And, you know, we don't give in to the intimidation. There was something that happened with David when he appeared. Um, he went to the battlefield to take food to his brothers and his one brother said to him, who do you think you are? You know, you, you arrogant, you insolent, you just meant to be out there looking after the sheep and you think you can take Goliath out? That was intimidation from his own brother. Um, and he didn't give in to that. 
you know, what happened with David and Goliath. So I'm going to give you two scriptures that I did share on Rory's page that I believe we need to remember today. And the first one is Isaiah 54, verse 17. Because when the enemy is intimidating God's prophets and prophetic people, we need to, we need to um, see that God has a more powerful way. God has a better way. God always has an answer. Isaiah 54 verse 17. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. Every tongue which rises against you in judgment you shall condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord and their righteousness is from me, says the Lord. And the word the, the heritage of the servants of the Lord can be translated as this is the assignment of the Herod, the servants of the Lord. It's our assignment to condemn every tongue that rises up against us in judgment. And that's not talking about um, your, your friend who started saying things about you. That's talking about tongues rising against you from the camp of the enemy. That you have the assignment to condemn those things. And what do we do? We... We hear the lies. We don't do anything about it. How do we condemn it? We prophesy words that God has given us to say. Our answer is to hear what God says and to say what God says. That's our weapon. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. There will be weapons formed against you, but God says they won't succeed because you have authority to condemn the lies. It's just intimidation and lies. And you condemn it. You say, you, uh, devil, whatever you say, this is not going to happen in my life. I don't receive it. You know, there comes an opportunity where, I'll try and remember what I said the other day, where words come at us. And even people bringing prophetic words to us that they say, God says this. Um, and it's not the right word. And you know what we do? A lot of people get shaken by this because they get a prophecy from someone that they don't know and they get this word and they think, oh, this isn't right. I don't know what to do now. Is this going to happen? It's the same principle here. Every word that's come against you that is not God, you condemn it. You say, I do not receive this in Jesus' name. And you begin to prophesy life over yourself. I'm talking with my hands a lot. And so um, I, this is what I said to Rory the other day. When you're eating something that you've cooked yourself or in a restaurant and you start eating something and you have this feeling, it tastes a little bit off. I don't know if this is right. And, and you know that you've eaten some of it already and so it's starting to digest. What do you do? You've got to get it out somehow or you're going to end up being sick with food poisoning or something. It's the same with receiving a word that someone speaks over you that you know is not right. I've had this before. Someone gave me a word about something and I knew it was not right. And I didn't say, oh, thank you, hallelujah. I didn't say a word. I left it. I walked away and straight away I said, no, I take authority over those words spoken over me. I do not receive them. I speak life over myself. And so it's like when you're eating something that you know you've died, that you don't have to finish eating the whole thing. You stop eating when you recognize something is wrong. <laughs> and even if you have received a word over your life, all you have to do is say, I'm not going to chew on this thing. <laughs> I'm not going to meditate on this thing. I'm not, because that's meditation. When you chew on something that you've heard, you're meditating on it. I'm not going to meditate on this thing. I'm not even going to entertain it for one minute. I take authority over these words that are wrong. And I send them back to where they come from. And I speak life over myself. It's the same thing. That's how we condemn the tongues that rise up against us in judgment. The other scripture is Isaiah 59, verse 21. Now remember, I'm talking about the level of the prophetic has been raised. We have to be prophesying in line with the heart of God, exactly what God gives us to say. And we need to be prophesying words that bring life to the church, but assignments against the enemy's camp. 
Words against darkness, not inviting darkness. Words of hope don't invite darkness. They repel darkness. So Isaiah 59 verse 21. As for me, says the Lord, this is my covenant with them. My spirit who is upon you and my words which I have put in your mouth shall not depart from your mouth, nor from the mouth of your descendants, nor from the mouth of your descendants' descendants, says the Lord, from this time and forevermore. Have his word in your mouth. If you want those wings and feathers to grow back, have his word in your mouth. Spend time in his presence. May, realize God made a covenant. His spirit who is upon you and his words need to be in your mouth. His words. What would God say? What would God say when you feel intimidated and you're saying, God, I'd rather just stay here in the wilderness. It's all over. I don't have a ministry. God's never going to provide for me. He's not going to send me to the right people, uh, this and that. That's not having his words in our mouths. <laughs> so if the level of the prophetic has raised and the opposition has raised, the devil, all the devil wants to do is dangle something in front of you to get you to agree with something that God has not said. And something that is a lie from the enemy's camp. So prophetic people, uh, I feel um, we need to be, what are we doing? We need to be asking ourselves, what are we doing with what God is saying to us? In the, these days of busyness, what are we doing with what he has said to us? Um, you know, are we interceding about what he says? I believe God is raising up intercessors of a higher caliber in these days because it's needed when Esther, Esther heard the, the Haman's plan, she called a fast. <laughs> These are supernatural days where we can't do things in our own strength. And fasting is a way to move in the, in, to get the supernatural strength of God. I hesitated when I said that because um, it's difficult for me to fast. So anyway, let's just move on. Um, so, so intercession, are we, you know, are we allowing the enemy to silence us or are we having God's word in our mouth? And when he says be quiet, are we being quiet? Do we understand authority? Do we understand protocols of when we release words and when we don't? Are we being obedient to the instructions of God? All of these things. When, when we do these things and we live as salt and light and we recognize we called, that God says you can do better, um, then we will become troublers to the camp of the enemy. So I'm going to leave you right there. Three minutes to three. Lisa Spaniolo, I'm so glad you found us. Wendy Lee, Shelley Belton, good to see you. Um, all the ladies on the equipping group, you're going to get a message, an email from me either this evening or tomorrow. Marianne Anderson, nice to see you, um, about the Zoom that we're going to do next week. Barbara Hassan. Okay, so I, I can't go through all the list because if I scroll, I might just switch you off by mistake and that'll be rude. So let me say goodbye and I'll look at all your comments in a while and see what you've all had to add there. But thank you so much for joining me today. And I remember, you're not called to spend the rest of your life running in the opposite direction and sitting in the wilderness under a broom tree. Remember the land mines. Don't take things from the old into the new. Watch out for offense. Watch out for the things that are familiar, those robes. Put on the new robes of the new season. Don't give in to intimidation. And begin to release words of hope. Start prophesying over your own life. Start prophesying in your own home, over your own family. Maybe when they're not there, if they're not Christians yet. If they're not serving God, prophesy over their lives. Words of hope. Okay, so on Saturday at the, in Somerset West, I shared my testimony of how I was going to God and I was praying for him to change someone and something. And he called me up and he said, stop doing that. I want you to prophesy over them how I see them. And how that turned the situation around so quickly. Same thing today. Don't go to God and say, God, look what's happening. What are you going to do? You're going to change it. Yeah, what does he have to say? Begin to prophesy those words of hope. Let the valley of trouble become a doorway of hope in your life in this season.
That's what he wants to do. Not in this season, always. That valley of trouble and hardship and struggle. And the promised land is over there, but all you're doing is struggling in the wilderness. He wants it to become a doorway of hope when you hear what he has to say. So have a fantastic day. I'm going to let you go. And I'll see you tomorrow with a bite-sized word. And I, I probably will not be live on Thursday morning. If I do go live, I will post up and let you know. But I, I might not. So I will see you soon again. Thanks for joining. Bye.